Okay. Hit your search button and go to SP127. Go a little slower in the beginning. My suggestion is you hit either two or three. I usually go three up to give me size. Give it a little magnification, which I will do. And my approach to menisci is that I work off the sagittal if it's a younger person first, the coronal if it's an older person first. Why? Efficiency. You're going to fish where the fish are. And where are the fish when you're 60? In the meniscus body. And where do you see the body best? Coronal. Where are the fish when you're 20? In the back or the front. So that's why we'll use the sagittal first in a younger person. It's expedient. It's faster. It's efficient. It's going to make you better. The next thing I do is I look at the meniscal size. I look at the depth, the volume, and the position relative to the condyles. Is it under the condyle or is it slipped out from under the condyle? So-called partial extrusion or pseudo-extrusion. In other words, is there good conformity and alignment? The very last thing I do, by the way, is look at the signal. And I analyze the signal for its verticality, horizontality, complexity. I look for areas of interruption, like this one, or disappearance, like this one, in the sagittal projection, meniscal ghosting. The next thing I do is I compare the two menisci for intrameniscal signal. The medial meniscus, because of weight bearing and the normal valgus inclination of the knee, always has more signal than the lateral meniscus until you get a bit older. And things start to dry out a little bit and your knee starts to change. The conformity of your knee changes. The convexity of the condyles change. Now if I've identified a meniscus abnormality, I'm going to look at where it is. Is it at the root, next to the root? Is it in the posterior horn, the horn body junction, the body, the anterior body horn junction, or the smaller anterior horn, medial or lateral? The position of the tear is not critical to the, to the clinician, but it's nice to have the right location. I'm also going to assess in the body, whether the tear is in the inner third, middle third, or outer third, so-called white-white zone, red-white zone, and red-red zone. We can also see white-white zone, red-white zone, white-white zone, inner third, middle third, outer third. I'm going to give it a length. No, I don't sit there with my measurer and measure the tear, because that takes me an extra two minutes. If I do that 10 times a day, that's 20 minutes of measuring. People that measure things all day long, they're boring, and they're usually not sexually active. So let me show you what I do. I know that the meniscus is going to be approximately six and a half to seven centimeters long. So if my tear is here, I just break it up into thirds. If it's in the back, well, it's about two centimeters, two and a half centimeters. So I'll say two to two and a half. I've got another two centimeters here and another two centimeters here. So I'll give a range. So if it goes all the way from stem to stern, from root to root, it's about a six to six and a half centimeter tear. It's got the whole meniscus. So you can guesstimate it by looking at the length of the tear based on the number of slices or if you're comfortable with the anatomy, where you are on the meniscal target. Now, the covering of the meniscus is, is a bit different. In other words, how much meniscus you have, we'll see a little bit later, depends on which side you're on. The lateral and the medial side, it's about 80-60 in terms of the amount of covering of the articular surface. But once you lose the meniscus, not good things happen. Now, the hyaline cartilage underneath, vulnerable. The bone underneath, vulnerable. The shape of the condyle, vulnerable. So I look at these secondary findings to decide, is my meniscus tear relevant? Because you know what? Everybody over age 60 has a meniscus tear. Quite a few of you have an asymptomatic meniscus tear. The menisci crack. What else do I look at? I look at whether that tear is unstable and needs surgery. And we're going to talk about that a little later on. What are those criteria? So this is our introduction 
uh, to, to the meniscus. So now that we've identified this tear, where is it? It's all the way in the back. So if we're getting a series of sagittal slices, what's going to happen? Slice, slice, slice. We're going to go through this hole. And that's where we are right here, in the hole. A meniscus ghost. It's gapped. How much is it gapped? We, we could measure it. We can eyeball it, too. Don't like to measure a lot, but that's about a 7 or 8 millimeter gap from side to side, which helps determine whether you're going to operate on it. Is it in the inner third, middle third, or outer third? Well, all three thirds are affected. That, even though it's not as bad as that, that doesn't look like that. That's not a nice black triangle. But it started on the inside and went to the outside. It's a radial type of tear. Radial tear is looking like this. It's also right near the meniscus root. So radial tears are like this. It's a type of vertical tear, and it's pretty straight. So you usually see it on one cut. You're out of it, you're in it. So if you scroll sagittally, you'll be out of it and in it very quickly. All right, what else is associated with this tear? Well, we said loss of the meniscus makes the hyaline cartilage vulnerable. It is. Blow up your sagittal. Blow it up really big. That's what the cartilage should look like. Look at the fuzzy, ill-defined thin cartilage in the back. That is not normal. That is extensive class 2 to 3 chondromalacia over the tear. No surprise there. How about the subchondral bone? Multiple linear hypointense foci in the subcortical subchondral bone with osteoedema. Lots of osteoedema. A subcortical insufficiency fracture, also known as a SIF. It's a 48-year-old female. She was running across the street and felt a pop. What do you think popped? Answer, I don't know. But there's only two possibilities. Her meniscus popped or her bone popped. Yes, a subcortical insufficiency fracture, acute, will be associated with a pop. So one or both of those things occurred when she was running across the street. To complete the exercise, we should close the loop. Lots of people run across the street and they don't get a meniscus tear and a fracture. She needs a DEXA. It's a woman. She's got an acute fracture. We got to work her up for osteoporosis. Calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase. You're real doctors. You are imaging clinician specialists. You're not radiologists. You're clinicians. You're helping other clinicians and your radiologists. One last caveat. Where is this thing? Let's blow up our coronal. Let's make it as big as we can get it. We're going to focus on these structures right here, the roots. The meniscus roots are ligamentous anchors in the back to the posterior tibia, in the front to the tibial spines. Some of these anchors sit in very close proximity to the cruciates. For instance, the anterior root sits right at the base of the ACL, and many people say that they merge. There's the ACL. There's the root attachment. More commonly, because the medial meniscus is more rigid, it is more prone to medial root injuries. What do medial root injuries lead to? Partial extrusion of the meniscus. Meniscus not there anymore, partially extruded. What happens? Chondromalacia subcortical insufficiency fracture, it all goes together. As Soon as I see A, I know I'm looking for B, C, D, and E. I know before I even see it. You can classify these root abnormalities by purely ligamentous. There's a classification system I will share with you a little bit later. But they can purely involve the ligament. They can be within three millimeters of the ligament. They can be three to six millimeters away from the ligament or greater than six millimeters away from the ligament, or they can completely disrupt the ligament and completely disrupt the meniscus tissue itself. So you see you can have true tears of the actual ligament, you can have true tears of the meniscus interfacing with the ligament, next to the ligament, a little further away from the ligament, and these posterior lesions near the root are very important to identify and have only come into our stream of consciousness in the last decade. So the diagnosis is posterior horn meniscus tear 
adjacent to the root attachment within three to five millimeters of the root, root attachment with a gap of seven to eight millimeters, trizonal with subjacent class two to three chondromalacia and weight-bearing subcortical insufficiency fracture or SIF. That is your dictation. That is your conclusion. And it's going to be tight and brief.